David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is, uh, hmm, just checking on the calendar. Friday, January 15th, 2021, apparently. I don't know anything about it. Uh, Ides of January, in case you're keeping track of those things. And these days, maybe you should. Uh, I don't know. Forget it. Let's not do the show. All right. Well, okay. Uh, we'll roll forward with it. I don't know what to tell you today. It's uh, We're in transition, I, I guess. Uh, no armed rebellion afoot currently, but uh, actually plenty of write-ups in the papers today on some of the charging documents from the activities of last Wednesday, warning us specifically in the voice of uh, U.S. attorneys that the uh, insurrection is ongoing and ought to be uh, considered not anywhere near finished. In the wake of all this, as they charge people with more and more serious crimes, charging more and more people, identifying more and more people, uh, we have word yesterday, of course, from the airlines trying to co help cooperate in clamping down on the return of armed insurrectionists to Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I will tell you, I told you already, and I will tell you again, they do, the plan is, I mean, they are distributing the same calls for gathering in Washington, D.C. this weekend and on into and I guess through uh, Wednesday, Inauguration Day, uh, of the same people. And they're hoping for the same numbers. I don't know whether they're really going to be able to produce the same numbers. I think that January 6th might have been just sort of a rare moment in which they were able to get a critical mass together. But uh, the same call for assembly and the same threats being leveled for the weekend and for Wednesday. And now, apparently, Donald Trump, uh, maybe realizing for the first time that he will not have control of Air Force One after noon on Wednesday, apparently uh, that came as a shock to him, and he's actually quite angry about that, and he's uh, furious at having to ask, or being told he has to ask for permission to use it, which is pretty amazing. And I... Don't really know why that wasn't told to him before. But anyway, uh, he now says he's contemplating having a farewell rally, which I like the farewell part. But um, actually, I don't want to I don't want him to fare all that well. But I, I, maybe us, the rest of us can fare well. Uh, but he's gee whiz. I'm not sure whether I'm going to have it in Washington, D.C. or maybe down at uh, Pervalago or somewhere else in Florida or something like that. Um, you know, the obvious answer is. Absolutely not. You can't have it in Washington, D.C. Had there been no insurrection, no attack on the Capitol, the answer would still be no. Washington, D.C., uh, F off. We're full. There's too many events of a high profile nature going on in Washington, D.C. COVID or not. I mean, let's add on top of that. Uh, we have uh, COVID to worry about. But ordinarily, Washington, D.C. is filled to the rafters for the inauguration. There's no place to have a public event of any size and also get the hell out of here. We don't have cops for you. We don't have anything for you. We don't have traffic cones for you. Get lost. And also you're out. You lost an OPS. Oh, you launched an arms insurrection against the government last week. I mean, it's a ludicrous request. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, uh, yes, let's see. Also on the preparation uh, agenda. I notice Armando commenting on this here. Kyle Cheney reporting uh, via tweet here. Uh, House investigators have asked 27 major travel companies from hotels to car rentals to bus lines to implement plans to disrupt potential insurrectionists ahead of the inauguration. Thank you. That'd be nice. They want these companies to retain records for law enforcement, uh, not only clamping down on people's ability to get back here, if they ever left, but uh, probably want their records for prosecution of what went on on Wednesday. Let's just take a quick look. I'll click through his thing. Uh, all right. Well, you know what? Uh, I'll, I would read you the list, but 
you guys are pretty smart. Do you know any major travel companies from hotels to car rentals to bus lines? Uh, bus lines. Let's get that one out of the way. Uh, anybody ever heard of any major bus lines like Greyhound? Yeah. Oh, okay. They're doing it. Uh, all the other ones too. Megabus, Bolt Bus, Lux Bus. That one I don't know. Vamoose. What is that? Oh, well, this appears to be a, a a list of a bunch of bus companies and car rental companies. You know all of them. Um, which one's number two? Did they put Avis at number two? No. See, they listed it third. Big opportunity missed there. Anyway, uh, Expedia, we got that on the list. Uh, the hotel chains, you know which one's not on the list? <laughs> See if you can think about that. Well, we're talking about major hotels, of course. Major, major hotels. Um, Let's see. I mean, how do they put this? Eh, who cares, right? They're looking for information. Giving the ongoing threat of violence. Here we go, down at the bottom in Washington, D.C. area and around the country. The committee requests that you develop and put in place additional screening measures to ensure that your services are not being used to facilitate violence or domestic terrorism. We checked in yesterday and heard about Delta Airlines and their checked firearms policy. I happened to see that Alaska Airlines was getting in on that uh, yeah, which is better than it sounds. Alaska Airlines doesn't just fly in, in and around Alaska, obviously. But uh, I think they were also curtailing the number of flights to D.C. from their regular schedule. They also request that uh, these companies retain all records regarding service requests and reservations from January 1st to January 31st, 2021, for potential use, if necessary, in future law enforcement or congressional investigations. And three, produce to the committee by January 29th, all company policies and procedures currently in place or being developed to ensure that your services are not used to facilitate violence or domestic terrorism. Uh, I don't know if I'll have any policies ready for you for that one. Most companies probably won't, but uh, they'll come up with something and send you a nice note. All right, just sort of noting for the record that that happened. Oh, and uh, well... Uh, look, I read it to you. I don't know if you need me to prove to you that it existed, but I accidentally closed that one. I should take it easy on um, on Scott for uh, uh, link-wise these days. He's had a tremendous uh, number of links to have to deal with over the last couple of days. But I think, unfortunately, we're probably going to do it again. We really need to clear out pocket, and uh, we'll never make it all the way to the bottom, of course. But so many things uh, laying around that needs some commentary, or at least I can send you to do the reading over the weekend. How about that? It's like homework. All right, let's see. Uh, why don't we lead off? Why not? Because it's here on top at, of pocket with this Politico piece. Uh, lawmakers who conspired with capital attackers in legal peril. You know who probably they're thinking of. Um, indications are that uh, somehow the Freshman Q lunatics did, in fact, participate in the uh, what the the tours, the so-called tours, the reconnaissance visits, uh, and led some of them uh, the reconnaissance visits from some for some of the insurrectionists the day before the violence. That would be on January fifth. How anybody thought that these people who were unfamiliar with you know, everything about the Capitol. Maybe they've been studying really hard during the transition period. There was an orientation. I mean, they're not brand new to the Capitol, but you'd think you'd want some more experienced folks leading those tours. Just as well that they didn't, and uh, they didn't give them anything of uh, tremendous value, but, uh, you know, they may have shown them a few ways around the buildings that they didn't know about before. Who knows? Uh, Going to be an interesting investigation, particularly since most of them were carrying smartphones and didn't do anything about protecting their privacy there. And uh, there's probably an electronic map, not only of their presence in the Capitol on the 6th, but also on the 5th. And it should be short work, really, for the FBI just to see, did the same phones, uh, did any <clears throat> phones that don't belong to people who work at the Capitol ping the same cell towers on both days and from the same position and Wi-Fi uh, connections, of course, as well. They may be able to use electronic metadata to recreate, uh, to help reconstruct the entire tour route. And it would be very interesting to find that on, let's say, January 5th, and of course, one of these members may also be carrying their own cell phone. Plus, there's, of course, inside... Uh, video surveillance. So I'm pretty sure they'll be able to pinpoint 
who did the tours, where did they take them, and then match that up with places that those insurrectionists actually went to. Uh, and I suppose some of the best proof you could ever show up in court with for anybody's trial would be, yes, we have video and cell phone data that puts, let's say, this you know, particular member of Congress A uh, in the same location as charged insurrectionist B on January 5th inside the Capitol at these various locations. And lo and behold, those locations were damaged or accessed and breached by insurrectionists, including insurrectionist B, as indicated by his presence of his cell phone again on January 6th, that would be pretty tough to beat. <laughs> so that'd be expulsion material uh, for those cases. Anyway, there are legal uh, consequences allegedly being discussed. Anyway, if any members of Congress are proven to have colluded with the rioters, their position likely won't save them from criminal liability. This is an interesting consideration alongside their insistence that they are immune from arrest for evading the metal detectors. I explained to you what might be at the heart of that claim, but I also explained to you that there were certain exceptions, I bet, they will pop up here in the article. I don't know whether they'll be called out by Josh Gerstein, who wrote the piece, but let's see. Lawmakers who in interacted with the pro-Trump protesters who rioted at the Capitol last week could face criminal charges and will almost certainly come under close scrutiny in the burgeoning federal investigation into the assault for a uh, former prosecutor said. I'd like to know what the current prosecutors say, but, you know, their mom on this. It's an ongoing investigation. This is incredibly serious, said Ron, I don't know how he pronounces it, Machen, M-A-C-H-E-N, Machen, probably not with that, but anyway, a former U.S. attorney for Washington, D.C., although you would need compelling evidence before charging a member of Congress with anything related to the breach of the Capitol that day, this has to be investigated. Unlike with the president, there's no Justice Department policy shielding members of Congress from legal accountability while in office. I'd say those are potentially viable prosecutions added Peter Zeidenberg, another former federal prosecutor in Washington. I'd say those guys should be worried. The role members of Congress may have played in facilitating the deadly attack drew intense attention this week after Democratic lawmakers alleged that some of their Republican colleagues facilitated tours of the Capitol on January 5th, one day before demonstrators engaged in the assault that terrorized lawmakers, ransacked congressional offices, and left as many as five people dead. Representative Mikey Sherrill of New Jersey sent a letter Wednesday formally asking the Capitol Police and congressional officials to investigate the tours, which she said were unusual, in a Facebook video. She said the visits amounted to a reconnaissance of the next day. The tours being conducted on Tuesday, January 5th, were a noticeable and concerning departure from the procedures in place as of March 2020 that limited the number of visitors to the Capitol. Sherrill and 33 colleagues wrote... The visitors encountered by some of the members of Congress on this letter appeared to be associated with the rally at the White House the following day. Cheryl suggested that access raised that access raised the possibility that the visitors were casing the building for the assault that unfolded the next day. Members of the group that attacked the Capitol seemed to have an unusually detailed knowledge of the layout of the Capitol complex, she wrote. Given the events of January 6th, the ties between these groups inside the Capitol complex and the attacks on the Capitol need to be investigated. Justice Department officials have said they are looking for all actors who were involved in the Capitol riot. The FBI has also called on the public to turn over evidence of those who instigated violence. Asked whether the probe includes potentially complicit lawmakers, a Justice Department spokesperson referred the questions to the FBI, which didn't respond, so no answers there. The chief organizer of Stop the Steal, remember that name, one of the groups behind the January 6th, one of the groups behind the protests that ended in violent assault on the Capitol, has claimed to be working with several Republican members of the House to organize the event, but it remains to be seen whether any coordination ahead of last week's rally extends to complicity in storming of con the storming of Congress. Democrats have raised several potential means for punishing GOP lawmakers who have been involved in either fomenting or directing the riot from congressional investigation to criminal sanction. I understand 
if there was an inside job, I hope we understand, if there was an inside job, whether it was members or staff or anyone working at the Capitol who helped these attackers better navigate the Capitol, this is going to be investigated. Representative Eric Swalwell said Wednesday on MSNBC. He also called out specific Republicans on Twitter, such as Lauren Boebert, for seeming to disclose House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's movements during the attack. To hell with the ethics committee. These people need to be charged criminally, said Sean Patrick Maloney on the same network. The issue even arose during the historic impeachment debate on the House floor, where Representative Cedric Richmond said some of his colleagues may well be co-conspirators. All right. Well, I think we all know all about all of this. Um, and uh, we've even been over some of the statutes that they may have violated, although uh, some of them only came up in the context of that uh, memo to former Attorney General, it was then Attorney General Bill Barr, outlining the various statutory options they had for charging Black Lives Matter protesters and so-called Antifa protesters with federal sedition charges. And now they seem to have projected themselves right into sedition charges for the insurrectionists of January 6th. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Are they uh, get around to the uh, constitutional issues at some point down here? I think so. Some lawyers have said the inflammatory speeches by Trump and Giuliani and Mo Brooks to the crowd that joined in a riot, the riot, a short time later, may be protected by the First Amendment. A lot of people do pretend to believe that. Fiery speeches are not uncommon at political events, and making speakers responsible for all actions taken by audience members could chill public debate. A little bit of a, it's an interesting parallel to the uh, uh, Trump demand for the re repeal section 230 of whatever the hell bill it is. Anyway, just thought I'd point that out. But ex-prosecutors say any criminal case against Trump or lawmakers would not be based solely on the speeches, but on other public and private communications, emails, texts, exchanged with uh, organizers uh, and supporters in the days leading up to the rally and on the day of the shocking attack. Investigators will be looking for a discussion of a physical assault on the Capitol building. We've seen it. And for indications that individual members were specifically targeted. We've seen that, too. Several experienced attorneys noted that any prosecution of political actors would be brought in Washington and that a local jury is unlikely to be sympathetic to claims that speakers were being colorful and not criminal. Hmm. Probably true. Uh, investigations of Congress face special challenges. Lawmakers can try to use the Constitution's speech or debate clause, which gives limited immunity to House members and senators to prevent investigators from accessing their communications related to their official duties of which this was not one. And by the way, the speech and debate is generally held to be uh, connected to congressional debate and issues. You know, uh, the, I mean, it's not strictly limited to the physical space of the Capitol necessarily. That would be too restrictive. But uh, they're supposed to be in the pursuit of their either official duties or, or at the very least connected with a campaign, all of which, of course, was... Over The speech and debate clause uh, comes from the same section that we were reading about the privilege from arrest. But uh, just so you know the wording of it, uh, they shall in all cases accept, and there are those exceptions again, and there are weird ones, right? Treason, felony, breach of the peace, could be all of those, right? They should be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the House, coming or going, and for any speech or debate, it does say here, in either House. They shall not be questioned in any other place. So, of course, you know, uh, let's say we could be strict constructionists on that. The original text says in either house and this wasn't there. So I think they get a broader reading of it in most cases. But hey, maybe not this time. Anyway, uh, it doesn't mean you're immune from arrest if you commit a felony of any kind. And or it doesn't even matter if you commit it, you know, in Washington, D.C., in the Capitol, what have you. Uh, lawmakers can try to use that as, uh, uh, as a defense, but it doesn't always work. For instance, they name here in 2007, the DC circuit court of appeals sharply criticized prosecutors for their handling in of a search of the office of Congressman William Jefferson. And yet you remember that, uh, he got in quite a bit of trouble and, 
uh, his career was ended. But they did have uh, criticisms for the way they handled things. Judges said members of Congress are entitled to advance notice of such a search and to review any materials investigators seek to seize. Not that they can't use it. You just got to go through a certain procedure. However, Zeidenberg said he's confident those obstacles can be overcome. There's no speech or debate clause that covers text messages with constituents about breaking into the Capitol, he said. And I think quite right there. With the number of individuals facing charges now above 70 and still climbing, some complaints about the slow rate of climb, but uh, they're doing reasonably well. And I think uh, there could be a big overnight vote dump of sorts. Uh, it won't necessarily be tonight, but I think one day you might wake up and say uh, to the news that uh, several thousand people have been identified by their cell phone signals and now face potential charges. Anyway, uh, what's up next here? Um, 70 and still climbing. Investigators also might not need to get communications from lawmakers or their offices in the first instance, but they can get them from the email accounts and devices of suspected rioters. And if it shows up there, all right, no problem in subpoenaing material from Congress. The first people to cooperate get the best treatment, said Joyce Vance, a former U.S. attorney in Alabama. Once they've identified people who went inside, they're going to want to turn over what they have, either because they have nothing to hide or because they want a deal. So it should not be very hard to get those communications. Some lawyers said the key question may not be whether a jury would convict but whether Justice Department officials, including Biden's Attorney General nominee Merrick Garland, decide the evidence of collaboration is strong enough to overcome concerns about intruding on the usual robust protections for free speech. It's a big buffer for political speech that would be a big part of the things Garland will have to look at. But this is nothing like I've ever seen from a political leader. Littman said of Trump's speech at the rally, it's a stronger case than the classic cases where the courts have come down on the political speech side of the equation. In his speech, of course, just before the attack, Trump urged his followers to, quote, fight like hell. However, Vance said charging the president or ex-president based solely on his comments at the rally would be challenging. They're susceptible, standing alone, to an interpretation that they're hyperbolic, she said. It's really the course of conduct you need sufficient to prove in, you'd need sufficient to prove intent to incite. There, this is a tough one, and I'm not sure it's a realistic expectation that the President of the United States is going to get indicted for sedition, absent a real smoking gun showing up. So we'll see. Uh, as time has gone on here, I think the case has gotten uh, more and more uncomfortable, let's say, for uh, people who continue to deny complicity in this. All right, let's see. What other items we have uh, hiding away here? Oh, yes, uh, that's for my own use. Uh, but in case you're interested in it, you can write me a note if you were interested in reading from Heinz Precedents. That's the Senate book of uh, practice and precedents. Uh, the record of the debate on the impeachment and trial of William Belknap now becoming uh, he's becoming more and more recognized every day or whatever it was. What was the comment that Trump made about Frederick Douglass? Anyway, uh, like Frederick Douglass, Belknap is dead. And uh, what can I tell you? Anyway, it's just interesting reading if you were ever wondering about that. I had an interesting debate via Twitter with somebody uh, sort of playing devil's advocate about what uh, Republicans will be arguing. We might as well get to this too. Obviously, you're all going to have an eye on the impeachment thing. Uh, it seems pretty settled at this point that there won't be a trial at any point before uh, Trump is out of office. And so the Republican plan is to just continue to talk past the Belknap precedent and other precedents for impeaching officials who have left office. Their best bet, if you want to know it, don't tell them. I think their best bet for differentiating uh, and I don't know if it's conclusive, but their best bet for at least saying, well, sure, they did it to Belknap, but that doesn't necessarily mean it applies in this case. It's not the fact that it's a president involved, but the nature of the departure from office. It was very persuasive to senators who were asked specifically the question uh, whether or not they thought the Senate had jurisdiction and could conduct this trial or should conduct this trial, given that, all right, well, you know, 
the automatic penalty is removal from office. Yes, we can also bar him from future federal office holding, but he's gone now, and it's 1876. Back then, uh, I guess they really actually expected that people would have shame and they wouldn't come back and try to hold office later on. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I, we, I, don't, we, I think we romanticize it. They were plenty of scoundrels back then, too. Uh, anyway, um, I guess... Uh, they had this specific debate about it. The House also debated whether or not they should go ahead with the impeachment. Uh, I'm sure I mentioned at some point that the word of Belknap's resignation actually reached the House committee considering the impeachment resolution before they voted on that. But they voted yes and then sent it to the floor. And the, of course, by that point, the whole House knew he had resigned and they still also went ahead. And then the Senate had the same debate. And that's what we're talking about, establishing a precedent. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there were definitely some members of the Senate who thought this should not be the case, but it was persuasive to the majority of them that, uh, the argument that you shouldn't be able to duck an impeachment by resigning. That is, you shouldn't be able to just walk away from this stuff and avoid accountability. And that was very persuasive to most senators. And so they said, let's go ahead, at least with the trial, and consider things. Uh, so like I said, the best point of differentiation would be if they said, well, that's not what's happening here. Trump isn't resigning, though perhaps he should have. And uh, that would be an interesting thing, because everybody asked him to resign, and he wouldn't do it. Uh, that might have saved him, possibly, or maybe it would have made things worse. So they're arguing that Belknap, by resigning, was looking to duck responsibility. But Trump, by having his term come to the natural end of things, doesn't take any affirmative action to try to duck responsibility here. That's a different sort of scenario. Think about that for two minutes, and then we'll come back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Wow, all right, let's see. Uh, what else can I put aside? Oh, I should uh, check back in here. I asked you to think about that over the two-minute break. Uh, that's probably the most significant difference here between the Belknap case and the Trump case. And it might be persuasive uh, to senators looking, Republican senators looking to escape having to deal with this thing. By the way, let me also point out, if Republican senators are really, truly looking for a way to escape this thing, like let's say this uh, this argument turns out not to be that persuasive, someone refutes it beautifully, and uh, you can see that it's not working anymore with Republicans, one way they can duck responsibility for this is to actually duck responsibility for this. Don't show up for the vote. I will remind you all that uh, it is a two-thirds vote to convict, but unlike the way they measure the votes for three-fifths, that is to say 60 in a full Senate, three-fifths for a uh, cloture to end a filibuster, it is not three-fifths, uh, as it is in the filibuster, three-fifths of the full Senate, the number of senators duly chosen and sworn, I believe is how the rules put it, uh, or what they call a constitutional three-fifths. But instead, it is the two-thirds majority of those present and voting. So if all the Republican senators decide to take a walk that day, or if we arrange a nice field trip for them or something else that might attract their attention, and don't show to vote either way, well, as long as there are 50 plus or 51 as a majority of the Senate present, they have a quorum. 
Now, somebody did point out to me that, well, they'll only have 50 senators and Kamala Harris, even if she's in the Senate chamber presiding, wouldn't count towards a quorum. And so 50 senators, if all the Republicans leave, they'd only have 50 senators and there wouldn't be a quorum. Uh, that's true. Of course, you could have Mitt Romney stay if he were interested in re, uh, repeating his vote from last time, or at least one uh, vote to convict anyway. But I also remind you that in Senate procedure, a quorum, though necessary for validating the procedures, a quorum is assumed until someone suggests there isn't one. So if you actually only had 10 Democrats show up for the day of the vote, so long as no one at any point says, I suggest the absence of a quorum and then lets the quorum call get to the end where they would definitively establish that there isn't a quorum, then it's assumed that you have one. So, and if anybody screws up, by the way, and says, I suggest the absence of a quorum out of force of habit, because it's a delay, you know, it's a usual transition tactic when there's nobody coming in to speak and they just don't want to close the session. You just say, I suggest the absence of a quorum and they start calling the roll. If you ever watch C-SPAN 2, you know, that's when the classical music comes on. Anyway, <clears throat> so long as no one says, I suggest the absence of a quorum, the uh, Senate assumes there is one. If you uh, screw up and say that you suggest the absence of a quorum, well, the thing to do is to come back to the floor, you or someone else. And during the uh, proceeding of the quorum call, just say, I ask unanimous consent that the roll call be dispensed with. And, and if no one objects, and probably won't because 90 of them are on a field trip, and the other 10 are in cahoots, then the quorum call is suspended, and no one is any the wiser. So I just thought I'd throw that one out there. That's a neat trick and something to remember. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about uh, that one difference between Belknap, who resigned to duck, hoping to duck charges and responsibility, and Trump, who did not, but also is looking to duck responsibility. That, that might be the best thing to discuss there. Does anybody regard this president as a person who isn't trying to duck responsibility? I mean, we asked him about, do you take any responsibility for dealing with the pandemic? No, I take no responsibility at all. That's just like his second favorite phrase. Anyway, uh, of course, the other persuasive argument was there's very little reason to have the disqualification penalty available if it isn't available against ex-officials, whether they have resigned or uh, we force them out. As uh, Steve Vladek pointed out uh, yesterday and, uh, or the other day, and I think we read it yesterday, but in case this didn't come through clearly, uh, or you need a refresher on it, because it's a little bit weird and complicated, but I love the elegance of the argument, right? Uh, there are lots of Republican, so-called congressional scholars on the Republican side who insist, no, 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 the clear language of the Constitution says that this is a penalty, this is a remedy only available as against uh, current office holders. And obviously that argument by itself is... Uh, is entirely diffused by the Belknap case. Then you could parse the reason why it's available, and uh, that's to prevent people from ducking responsibility by resigning. But either way, as Vladek was pointing out, you have the remedy of barring future federal service available to you. That seems plain from the Constitution. And given that it is a second penalty a penalty that is not automatic, that requires a separate vote. And remember, it uh, only requires a vote by majority, by the way. But you can't skip right to it. You have to have the first vote to convict first. And there never is a second separate vote on removal from office because removal is considered automatic upon conviction. After you convict somebody, of course, is the only time that you can discuss and vote on how you will punish them. And a, a binding punishment, that would be, in other words, the Senate voting to inflict this punishment. That's what would make it binding. You could talk about it, I guess, but it wouldn't be germane to debate at any point until you had already convicted the person. But Vladek's point was, if the argument is that 
impeachment and its penalties are simply not available against people who are no longer in office, then the bar from office penalty is a nullity. And we've imposed it three times unconstitutionally. Why? Because the only way you can start discussing whether or not to bar someone from office is if they've been convicted. And if they've been convicted, removal is automatic. And if removal is automatic, then they're ex-officials, even if you just impeached them. That's what makes them ex-officials. Whether they resigned, uh, you know, uh, tried to wrap themselves in an invisibility cloak and duck away forever or didn't resign. Uh, even if they didn't, they stayed in office. Once you've convicted them, they're now no longer current officials under the United States. So what are you doing talking about penalizing this poor, uh, uh, downtrodden and, uh, besieged private citizen? So it, it's just, plain nonsense to claim that the impeachment penalties are not available against ex-officials. They're all designed to be used against ex-officials. And the process preceding it is what you use to make them ex-officials if they refuse to go on their own. So there's a little bit of a logic problem with the best Republican argument about uh, against being able to use this and having no jurisdiction to do this thing. Anyway, in case you were wondering about the precedent itself, you can read the whole thing in Heinz Precedents. I'll even give you the link to do that. I, I, I bet you'll all be bored and fall asleep if you try to do that. But the most interesting takeaways from that, I guess, uh, are those that came in my debate with a devil's advocate online who was saying, well, look, in the Belknap case, uh, many senators, Republican senators will claim that the Senate acquitted him, which they did. He was not convicted. They did decide they had jurisdiction to hold the trial first, then they held it, then they had the vote, and they did not vote to convict. They needed the two-thirds in order to convict. But the argument is the Belknap uh, case ended in acquittal because the Senate, and that's wrong, but several senators thought, but the Senate didn't think this, that because the trial was should be considered moot because he had resigned, that's why they didn't convict him. And there were several senators who said that was the case. I didn't vote to convict because I think the trial's moot. Uh, okay, semi-persuasive. So what you do, of course, is you go and you find out how many, because that would matter. So you look at the record. And the record isn't that strong on that, in case you're wondering. They will argue that that's the case. But the thing is, without a majority to back them up back in that uh, I don't know, it was a 40-something Senate. Back in 1876, uh, when they held this trial and they held this vote, uh, this was a minority view, right? So if our argument is there's Senate precedent for impeaching and holding a trial and even the validity of the penalties as outlined in the Constitution for, or, uh, for use against former federal officials, to say that there's precedent for that means that it's something, one, that they've done before, and two, that they've tested with a vote. And how do votes work? They are won by majority vote. And, you know, this is not uh, a mystery. Uh, people are used to this. Uh, people are used to interpreting the Supreme Court this way, right? Uh, if a case comes down that decides that, uh, you know, X uh, statute is unconstitutional, by a 5-4 decision, does anybody argue that there's precedent for the constitutionality of that statute because four members of the Supreme Court said it was perfectly fine? No. There's value to the minority opinion, of course, and it might launch different arguments or points of differentiation if another case, a similar case, is ever brought in the future. And you can say, well, you know, four justices did think that this was a close call, maybe under these new facts, that would be the prevailing opinion. Let's find out. There's value to minority opinions, but they're not precedent. There would be no Supreme Court precedent in favor of that uh, 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 statute, which had been struck down. You couldn't say there's precedent in favor of that, because there isn't. Similarly, it's a huge mistake to say there's Senate precedent against using impeachment against former officials because 
the people who thought that the case was moot lost the vote. That's just ridiculous. You can't argue that. But you will see Republicans saying it anyway. So you need to know exactly what happened here. So they never got a majority at any of the votes. And there were arguably two that had any bearing on whether or not impeachment is a proper remedy for someone who's left office. The most important one was when they had a vote on that. And in that vote, the majority said, uh, yeah, you can use it. It's perfectly fine. There was a second vote which could kind of sort of, if you squint at it, be used to determine whether or not they were really, really, really serious about doing anything now that they had already decided to use this procedure, which was the vote on conviction. But remember, again, that that one requires two thirds. Here, uh, you are trying to argue that the minority view of considerably less than half the Senate, less than one third, or I guess just over one third of the Senate would be having to, you know, all you'd need to establish this idea that there was this fake precedent is one third of senators. Why would that be establishing anything? That's a losing vote for anything, for any, by any measure. So anyway, we went into, I went into the numbers uh, and reminded our critic here that there were two votes and two decisions here. One was the one he referenced. That would be the question on the verdict. And though they didn't opt to convict Belknap, uh, and some number of senators did reiterate that they still thought the trial was moot and said as much. I voted against holding this trial in the first place, and now I vote against conviction as a result. But, you know, again, since all it takes to block an, a uh, conviction is one third of the Senate, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, but then what about that other vote? The, the time they directly addressed, is this proper? Well, I got the numbers on that vote. Uh, and on the question of whether or not conducting the trial would be appropriate, the question of jurisdiction, the vote was 37 to 29 that it was fine. I mean, that's a relatively close vote, but there weren't that many senators at the time. By the way, uh, just as I was telling you before, it's a matter of uh, the number of senators present and voting at the time. This one, of course, didn't require two thirds, but 37, 29. That's not a lot of senators. Uh, of course, we had fewer states back then, but there were a lot of senators missing, as it turns out. And that becomes important. Uh, let's see. 37 and 29 is 66. I believe there were 74 senators at the time. So, you know, a fairly substantial number missing. Anyway, here is the only precedent there is established on this question, a majority vote that the Senate would have jurisdiction against an ex-official. Now, later on, when they'd held the trial and more evidence had been, all the evidence had been brought out, they still were able to muster more than a third to acquit. And so therefore, you know, it's all done. He's not convicted. Uh, but to the vote there was, I believe there were 25 votes. I don't know what the whole, um, I don't know how many votes there were for conviction offhand now, but I remember that there were 25 votes uh, for acquittal and that the record reflected that 23, and that's a substantial number of 25, 23 of the 25 said that they were voting to acquit because they still believed the whole thing was improper and the Senate never had jurisdiction in the first place. So that's an impressive portion of the number of voting to acquit. But of course, it doesn't say anything about where the majority was. The 37 who said that there was jurisdiction didn't change their minds. And in fact, again, the vote on jurisdiction was 37 to 29. After the trial was held, how many senators showed up voted to acquit and said, the reason I'm voting to acquit is because we don't have jurisdiction. And the answer is 23. They lost votes as a result of not only the passage of time, but as a result of holding the trial and I guess presenting the evidence or a bunch more people played hooky. I'm not exactly sure which, but they had 29 votes against jurisdiction when the trial was set to begin and they could only muster 23 votes affirmatively against 
uh, or, or impliedly against jurisdiction, since that wasn't directly on point in the vote. But they came out and put statements on the record that said that's what they were thinking. So that's great. I'm glad they marked out their position and left that for posterity. But they lost six votes in a Senate of 76 or 74. That's no small matter. The idea that the Senate had no jurisdiction got even less popular in the, during the Belknap trial. So it's about the weakest precedent I've ever heard of, quite honestly. Uh, and well, you should keep it in mind in case you ever run into this argument, because you will see it being presented. Tom Cotton already picked it up and was uh, in the papers the other day, uh, parroting the, uh, argument of judge, former judge Ludwig, that the Senate lacks authority, lacks jurisdiction to hold an impeachment trial after Trump leaves office. So I think that pretty effectively squashes all of that. And, uh, well, now you're fully armed and you can read the full story of the debate in Heinz precedence if you want to. And I'll give you a link to find it online. How exciting is that? All right. Let's see. Uh, other news, uh, non-impeachment and insurrection related news, I guess. Uh, the word is out of a Joe Biden, a prospective Joe Biden proposed emergency coronavirus plan. You have doubtless seen this news. And once again, I will say it's a little disappointing in the sense that they are working under the same uh, assumption that they need to fear the price tag, which, you know, uh, we've had varying opinions expressed here on. But uh, they're playing the same uh, optics game, I guess, unless this is total coincidence that they landed on a total package value here of $1.9 trillion, which has the feel of a package that somebody said, let's keep it under the round number of $2 trillion, just as they did that one time for the stimulus uh, uh, proposal in the beginning of the Obama administration. Let's not, just don't hit a trillion. Just take out whatever you have to in order to, uh, to avoid hitting that round number. Anyway, the Washington Post has a roundup of the the plan and what's in it. I guess the thing that's gotten the most attention has been the direct relief to families and the payments that we were uh, rallying for, uh, cranking up to the $2,000 level versus the $600 level that Republicans in the Senate held out for and forced on us uh, prior to the results of the Georgia uh, Senate runoff elections. So now we have an interesting and weird semantic fight going on. And of course, uh, there's more to it than just the semantics. Uh, lots of struggling families who, uh, for whom it makes a substantial difference. Um, but we're, you, you've seen it by now. We're stuck in this problem, right? We had the $600 checks, then the campaign in Georgia in which the both candidates and outside uh, advocates, plus even Joe Biden, said, look, if you want to get $2,000 checks, you got to vote for these two uh, Senate candidates in Georgia and help us win a majority in the Senate. Everybody understood why. And now it's time for them to deliver on that. Although I will note that the Georgians are not here to weigh in on how they feel about this thing. But now we're in this position. All right. If you want a $2,000 check, vote for the Democrats. People did. They haven't been installed yet, but they will be. Now the plan is out and people look at the plan and they said, eh, it's a $1,400 check in here. Well, okay. Yeah, the argument is, well, you're getting the $600 checks from the last bill. This bill proposes $1,400 more to bring it up to $2,000. $2, if you want $2,000, vote for the two Dems in the Senate race and send them there and, and Biden will deliver $2,000. No, no. You said vote for the two Democrats in Georgia if you want a $2,000 check. This check doesn't say $2,000 on it. It says $1,400 on it. So you see where we're stuck here. Uh, and I don't know what to, I, I don't know where I come down on this one in terms of 
the semantics of it. However, I will say, I mean, I don't think anybody really could be seriously accused of lying here to say, well, if you want, what I meant was, eh, yeah, but what you said was, all right, well, there's semantics to play on both sides, as it turns out. People are pointing, you can make a case. You said a $2,000 check, and this is a $1,400 check. We understand why it would come down at $1,400. On the other hand, you know, did I say, you know, a $2,000 check? Yeah, I might have said that. Okay, that sucks. Uh, but the point was, that uh, what I meant was, if you want $2,000, vote for us. And then here's the $2,000. Uh, as I understand it, uh, you know, I hate to hang this on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez again. I don't know what, I don't know where she comes down on all of this uh, at the moment. I'm sure she's pushing for another, a $2,000 check on top of the $600 check. And let me say this. That's not bad. I mean, I don't know what it does to the, you know, the budget, et cetera. No one knows yet. I mean, it, it makes a bigger hole in it if you're a believer in either the ability to blow a hole in the budget or the, uh, the idea that it matters to have a hole in the budget. But we could discuss that later. But I mean, on the, on the policy and even the politics of it, you know, uh, twenty six hundred dollars probably really isn't going to bail everybody out of every problem that they're incurring, uh, thanks to the pandemic. And so maybe it's just fine. I'm I'm not automatically opposed to that, and I'm not too worried about what it does to the budget or the deficit or anything like that. I'm I'm just interested in the semantics of it because, as it turns out, um, AOC at some point said, uh, you know, if you want to get two thousand dollars. Vote for she and Rashida Tlaib. Well, AOC claimed that she and Rashida Tlaib had prepared an amendment to the uh, omnibus bill that was then moving that would contain that relief. Uh, and they had an amendment that would boost the number, but it would boost the number to two thousand dollars. So I guess there's uh, you know evidence on the record that even the people. Uh, who are directly pushing for or are often affiliated with, let's say, associated with the people who are now pushing for making it a $2,000 check on top of a $600 check. Even they had an amendment that didn't offer $2,600, but rather a total of $2,000. Well, what I meant was, yeah, okay. So anyway, so the circumstances have changed. I'm not opposed to making it $2,600. I don't know whether it's going to benefit anybody politically on the other side of this question to hold the line at 1400. But I guess there's so many different variables at play. Are you going to let the squad push you around? That's one way of viewing things. If you are, I don't know, let's say Abigail Spanberger type person. Uh, or another thing would be, uh, you know, are you going to let the squad push you around or are you going to help people as much as you can? or as much as they say they need, or as near to as much as they say they need as possible. I mean, hell, you could make an argument for $3,000 total too. There's really no reason why you couldn't or shouldn't. Uh, and so does it pay to draw a battle line over this? I can't answer that question for you in the space of two hours. Certainly not before the one minute break comes up at the top of the hour, but just thought I would lay that out for you there. Um, chime in, I guess, or think it over anyway over the weekend about how you feel about these things. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll form an opinion and see. Uh, I, I think probably it would not be wise to draw the battle lines this sharply right now Give yourself some wiggle room and uh, and and hopefully uh, someone can lend you a hand in crossing over the line or lend Joe Biden forces or whoever's forces you might label it as being who might be now holding the line at a fourteen hundred dollar check to take that wiggle room and welcome them over as opposed to saying, ha, I had him over a barrel and I kicked their ass. So think about that. There can be peace and reconciliation as between Democrats here even if that might not be the case between uh, real world and MAGA later on. All right, let's see. Uh, I'll bring this up here. Uh, another political article that appears to be totally wrong about everything and the way impeachment will proceed. It's a mystery to me where they thought they were going with this one. Uh, Burgess Everett and Andrew Desiderio, who are not, I don't think, necessarily known uh, for screwing things up terribly, with a partisan 
with partisan intent. But they put an article together yesterday, Trump impeachment trial crashes Biden's first 100 days. I mean, this is recycled headline at this point. I've demonstrated to you that there really should be no conflict and it's a very easy thing to avoid. But it appears, I, this was brought to my attention by Armando, uh, it appears that they just, I don't know what happened, whether somebody fed this to them or they tried to do this on their own and they read the rules and they screwed it up. And, you know, we can forgive them for that, except for the fact that they have this giant platform, which they then use to tell the wrong story about how Senate uh, impeachment procedure would go forward now that the impeachment uh, articles have been adopted in the House. Uh, haven't got time to do it before we head out for the one minute break, but uh, suffice to say, I am left with a lot of questions about how they came to these conclusions. And now it's a meta story. Who fed you this information? Or are you just trying to it'd be great if they were trying to read the rules and work it out on their own without relying on a source that might be badly biased to tell them how it would go, I think. But then it would be sad if you really can't figure these things out because it seems pretty clear. But uh, one, they make the claim right off the bat that, no, you can't both impeach Donald Trump and start confirming Biden's cabinet picks at the same time, which yeah, under normal Senate rules, if you leave it unchanged, a an impeachment trial is supposed to occupy all your time once it's begun. There's not supposed to be any other business, but there's Senate precedent for that too. The idea even of bifurcating the day is not without precedent. Um, and so, you know, I mean, that's just one of several options that they have available to them, including the committee option that I've mentioned that would avoid this conflict. But then they go on to say that the impeachment trial absolutely positively must, by rule, start at a very inconvenient time, 1 p.m. on January 20th, one hour after Joe Biden takes the oath of office, when senators are supposed to be busy with some other stuff. Although, you know, they've conducted business at that time in the past, usually confirming new cabinet officers but uh, whatever. But there's really no rule that says that's the case. We'll talk about it after this. Welcome back to the Kevin Morning Show. We're ready to roll here on Netroots Radio. Uh, right into this strange and unfounded and probably, I mean, unless I'm missing something serious, very wrong description of uh, impeachment proceedings in uh, the next couple of days, Trump impeachment trial crashes into Biden's first hundred days. The Senate's procedural hurdles raise the difficulty for Joe Biden's cabinet. Uh, raise, yeah, raise the difficulty hmm. for Joe Biden's cabinet and early legislative priorities like these uh, checks. But that'll just give us time to think them over again uh, for all of this to be approved quickly. No, it doesn't. President Donald Trump's impeachment trial is set to collide directly with President-elect Joe, uh, Joe Biden's inauguration, and there may be little anyone can do about it. I mean, the lead's just way wrong. It, it, I mean, it it's set, I guess it could be said to be set to collide directly, but it's easy to throw the switch, and there are a lot of tracks you can switch it onto. Absent the consent of all 100 senators, Trump's trial, and by the way, there aren't 100 senators at the moment, uh, that's actually the least of these problems. Trump's trial for incitement of insurrection will start at 1 p.m. on January 20th, just an hour after Biden is sworn into office and Trump becomes a former president, provided the articles arrive by January 19th. Uh, that is a super loose statement that causes, I think, most of these problems. Um, one more pause here. Um, Again, to go back to the, the uh, thought I expressed just before the break. Um, well, oh, my God, at 1 p.m. on January 20th, well, won't, won't senators be partying it up? Won't they want to be lining up to congratulate and shake Joe Biden's hand? Well, there's coronavirus epidemic, so no, they're not going to shake his hand. Um, and uh, not at all clear what sort of event this is going to be and how much gathering there's going to be and whether there's going to be, an, I guess not, inaugural balls and whatnot. But in a normal inaugural, um, what you might see, we saw at the last inaugural, remember, famously enough, we saw some very weird 
and awkward photos from it, but it's usually followed by an inaugural luncheon, which is also another one of those big gatherings that uh, you shouldn't be having. And quite frankly, it's a boring affair, and it's uh, stuffy and stupid, and nobody really wanted to be at it. Least of all, last time, Donald Trump. You remember how grumpy he looked at this thing? It was weird. It was a meal, and he was unhappy about it. I was astonished by that. I still am. Anyway, uh, I quite honestly, uh, coronavirus will be forcing them, I think, to do away with the inaugural luncheon. And it's probably a good thing. And people probably are like, great, I didn't want to be there anyway, quite honestly. But even when they do have the inaugural luncheon, what is usually happening is that some skeleton crew of senators is just elsewhere, that is to say, in the Senate chamber and not wherever they're holding the luncheon which is also very often held on capital grounds or very, very nearby. Uh, Anyway, the Senate is working on confirming their their cabinet nominees. By the way, uh, it is entirely possible to confirm a cabinet nominee uh, ahead of time. They certainly can do the preparatory work. Here we didn't see it done because Republicans were one- pretending the election hadn't been lost by their man, and two, that uh, that, that uh, somehow he was going to remain in office, or three, they just wanted to uh, screw up Biden and not allow him to hit the ground running and uh, get the job done. But at the very least, you can hold the usual interviews and confirmation hearings ahead of time. You know who the secretaries designate are, and you're not an idiot and you want there to be a smooth transition. So even though the fact that you it may be that you can't necessarily confirm them to the position right away. And it's been the practice, I think, of late to hold all those discussions and hearings ahead of time, but then hold the vote until after the actual inauguration. But I, I believe I've seen some precedent somewhere in the not too distant past, I think, you know, modern era for actually holding conf- confirmation votes ahead of time. Although that puzzles me and I'm not entirely certain because you know how they are about paperwork. There needs to be a paper nomination somewhere that arrives and is received in the Senate is processed properly and referred to committee, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't know if you can, you know, have a vote on something that hasn't arrived on paper yet. So I don't know. For some reason, I wouldn't ordinarily say, no, you can't do that. But I'm convinced that somewhere in the past I saw, well, they did. That's a surprising thing. I'll have to look that up at some point. Anyway, it won't happen here because Republicans are obstructionist jerks. Uh, But that doesn't matter that much because, like I said, the regular practice usually is they say, well, let's consider this and have the hearings. And then on January 20th, uh, the senators will return to the chamber uh, some of them skip the luncheon and then they hold the votes maybe later for afterwards and everybody can go and eat and then they go over and vote. Sometimes it's a short walk from the luncheon to the vote and they will hold a series of votes and confirm uh, some or all of the cabinet that very first day and everything's fine. Now, they didn't have any hearings or interviews or anything this time because they're obstructionists. There will be Republicans who say, we can't vote now because we got to hold all of that. So, you know. In some cases, the Democrats will concede that to them, and it's not necessarily all that bad a thing that there's nobody, you know, who's officially the secretary of the, hmm, pick one. Uh, And we can, of course, work with acting secretaries, as we frequently do, although some of the people who might ordinarily accede to those positions through the statutory schemes are uh, possibly uh, dangerous Trumpers. So you want to watch out for that. But uh, I don't even know that in this atmosphere after this and with an impeachment trial pending and a lot of embarrassment among Republican ranks, there's certainly them, those who feel none, of course. But uh, uh, I don't know how much sentiment there's going to be for vicious obstructionism in terms of getting a new cabinet installed. So we'll see. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Uh, and very often the fact that the inauguration is going on. Uh, get back to the reason for bringing this up is this worry that, oh, well, if the inauguration is taking place just an hour prior, getting the Senate to do some work an hour later, oh my God. You know, who who would ever have imagined such a thing was possible? Well, m- me and anyone who's ever watched another president be installed. But it's a boring procedure and 
Yeah, nobody cares much about it. And the, but the reason nobody knows much about it is it's never been interesting. The reason it's never been interesting is because, of course, they install the cabinet, even when there's something important going on 10 feet away in the Capitol building. So can they do it with an impeachment trial? Well, it's a different thing, and it may be more exciting, but it's the same mechanics. Can you walk from this part of the Capitol, usually uh, or of late, the rotunda, although sometimes it happens elsewhere, over to the Senate and vote on somebody? Yeah, sure. What's the problem? Can you inaugurate somebody where you're not even gathering as a large crowd because of COVID and then leave that and walk to another part of the Capitol and vote on an impeachment question? Sure. Why not? So that premise out the window. Uh, moving on here, they are claim that the trial will start at 1 p.m. on January 20th, provided the articles arrive on January 19th, isn't true. Uh, one, of course, there's the question of when will they arrive. I'm not sure exactly what the House plans to do with their articles. They've passed them. They've named their managers. They have authorized the House to send a message to the Senate informing them of all of this. You actually have to do that, even though they can read the newspaper. Uh, and it, that becomes important in the Senate procedural rules for a for an impeachment trial. And I, I have the feeling, I don't know whether Burgess Everett and Andrew Desiderio, the authors of the article, uh, read the rules themselves and interpreted this way, or someone else read them and interpreted this way and told them this. But it is true, I guess we'll go pull up those Senate impeachment rules and take a look through them, but uh, there's a much better explanation of them than just the rules, uh, which is uh, in a CRS report, uh, Congressional Research Service, you're, I think, familiar with all of them, um, laying out Senate and House uh, in a separate document. House has got one, Senate's got another one, procedural rules for an impeachment. But here's the straight up rules. Uh, without any additional commentary or interpretation on how they work. The rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials. Uh, last revised 1986, uh, number one, you know, some flowery language, and we've been through it before. Whensoever the Senate shall receive notice from the House of Representatives, that's what you need to hear right now, that managers are appointed on their part to conduct an impeachment against any person, by the way, even if they're not in office, and are directed to carry articles of impeachment to the Senate. Right? So when the Senate gets notice from the House that managers are appointed and that the managers have been directed to carry the actual articles of impeachment over to the Senate, when that happens, the Secretary of the Senate shall immediately inform the House of Representatives that the Senate is ready to receive the managers. Why? For the purpose of exhibiting such articles of impeachment agreeably to such notice. That's very nice and all that. But what does it mean? Basically, it means that when the message gets to the Senate that the House has managers and that managers are ready to come over and exhibit the articles. And what does that mean? That means read them to you and then leave them with you to examine. When they get that notice... The Senate will tell the House in a message, OK, come on over at X time. They will make up a time and put it in a note and send it over there. And that's how the managers will know when to come over. Now, rule two, when the managers of an impeachment shall be introduced at the bar of the Senate. Remember, the managers are from the House when they get over there and they come and they arrive in the Senate. And they signify that they are ready to exhibit articles of impeachment against any person. Right? The presiding officer of the Senate shall direct the sergeant at arms to make a proclamation. Uh, and then the proclamation is everybody shut up and be quiet. We're going to do an impeachment this, in fancy language. After which the articles shall be exhibited. And then the presiding officer of the Senate shall inform the managers of this that the Senate will take proper order on the subject of impeachment of which due notice shall be given to the House of Representatives. What is this telling us? We figured out rule one. Rule two means when the invitation from the Senate to the House managers gets to the House and the House managers have responded and showed up, you will tell everybody to shut up and listen. And then you will say, all right, exhibit your articles. And then they will exhibit the articles. And then the Senate will say, we are going to decide how things will proceed from here. 
you guys go back to the house and we will send you another note when we have decided how to proceed from here and then invite you back for the beginning of that procedure. Now, rule three is where I think things go awry for the political writers. Upon such articles being presented to the Senate, the Senate shall at one o'clock after noon the day following such presentation, by the way, Sunday is accepted in these rules. So at one o'clock in the afternoon on the day after the presentation or sooner if ordered by the Senate, then the Senate will proceed to consideration of those articles of impeachment and shall continue in session from day to day, Sundays accepted, after the trial shall commence, unless otherwise ordered by the Senate, until final judgment shall be rendered, and so much longer as may in its judgment be needful. Before proceeding to the consideration of the articles of impeachment, though, the presiding officer shall administer an oath, here and after provided, to the members of the Senate, then present, and to other members of the Senate as they shall appear, whose duty it shall be to take the same. <sighs> Flowery language again. But again, rule three here is, once the presentation has been made, one o'clock in the afternoon on the day after the presentation, or sooner, if the Senate says so, then the trial will start. And then remember, once the trial starts, you're not really supposed to be doing anything else until you get to the end of the trial. That's why people think, oh, if we have an impeachment trial, uh, Biden won't be able to install his cabinet because they can't hold votes on confirming anybody. Uh, but that's up in the air. But this is where the one o'clock on the day after thing comes from. But you see that they've misread it here. What do they say in the Politico article? The problem for them is that the trial will start at 1 p.m. on January 20th, just an hour after Biden is sworn in, provided the articles arrive by January 19th. Well, they're not going to be in session, uh, it seems, until January 19th. So if the articles were to arrive today, let's say, and fulfill this condition that they put out there, they've now arrived by January 19th. Does the trial start at January 20th at 1 p.m.? No. They come in on the 19th. What's waiting for them? Maybe. A message, and by the way, the articles won't, now that I think about it, the articles won't arrive, I don't think, uh, at the, in the Senate. I mean, they can't. So I think the premise is wrong uh, on a number of fronts here. But let's say they did, because there is a possibility that uh, you don't have to have the Senate in session for the articles to arrive, but I'll have to explain why that's complicated. But uh, according to the strict reading of the rules, what's happening here is, the House has to send the Senate a message that says we've passed articles of impeachment. We have appointed managers and the managers are ready to come and present the articles to you as soon as you invite us. Right. So that arrives. Let's say that arrives today. Let's say it arrived yesterday. If they're not in session until the 19th, the Senate comes back on the 19th. What do they find? They find a note to them from the House of Representatives. Oh, look at this. The House has passed articles of impeachment and appointed managers, and they're waiting for an invitation from us to come over here and present these articles of impeachment. Now, you all remember the rule that says once they've presented the articles of impeachment, the next day at one o'clock, we have to start the trial. Do you guys want to start the trial at one o'clock tomorrow? No. Or maybe yes, but no, I, I wouldn't. Uh, should we... Send them that message then that we have to send them now that says, come on over. Well, why don't we wait so that they don't come over? Or why don't we do this? Why don't we say, come over next Thursday or at 10 a.m. or whatever. Come up with any date you want. Send the House that message. The message will receive, be received in the House. The House will say, look at this. The Senate invited us next Thursday at 10 a.m. At which point, if we say, yes, let's go, they go, they show up, they say, we're here. The sergeant at arms presents them at the bar. The secretary of the Senate presents them at the bar. The Senate says, present your case. Give us your articles of impeachment so we can uh, or exhibit them for us. Uh, they'll read them at 10 o'clock in the morning the following Thursday. And then at that point, they'll say, why don't you go back and we will set the order of trial and how we want to handle these things. And we could try and delay it. We could bring it back sooner, whatever. But if, it, if by default at that point on Friday at one in the afternoon, the trial would begin. 
but why on Friday? Because they didn't invite them to come and present the articles until Thursday. So this, I think, is just a huge misreading of what's going on here. Uh, as they put it, and again, in the article, they say, well, if the articles arrive by January 19th, then the trial starts at 1 p.m. on the 20th. No, the trial starts at 1 p.m. on the day following the exhibition of the articles. That's a different thing. Now, how might it be? How might it be said? As we'll, we'll do we this like a seder? It's a teaching thing, right? Uh, how might it be said that the Senate or the senators need not be present in order for this clock to start? Well, there is a mechanism by which houses in adjournment can designate essentially agents to receive their messages such that government business gets done. It's actually was designed mostly as a fix for allowing for adjournments, even longer adjournments and still preventing things or the original plan for how to prevent um, uh, recess appointments, etc. Now they resort to having pro forma sessions in order to do that. But basically Usually the house authorizes the clerk of the house to receive messages to the house, even in the absence of the members and the secretary of the Senate similarly authorized to receive. And in some cases respond to messages sent to the Senate, even in the absence of most of the senators. So you could argue that if the message has been sent to the Senate, that the house has passed its articles of impeachment and appointed its managers and they seek admission to the Senate, the Secretary of the Senate is or perhaps authorized to answer and make invitation even in the absence of the senators. Although I am not positive that the authorization includes uh, uh, allowing the Secretary of the Senate to answer on behalf of the Senate without their directing the Secretary to do that. So I don't know that the invitation can be issued by the Secretary of the Senate absent a session. Now, Friday, today, they're scheduled to have a pro forma session over in the Senate, and it may be that one of the things that they do is uh, lock in by unanimous consent, and here, Democrats could prevent it if they think it'll be used to screw things up, but I don't think they believe that. They could, by unanimous consent, direct the Secretary of the Senate to respond to the House's message if the House's message has been sent. I don't know where you look, even, to find out whether the message has been sent. And you can't count on reporters who don't, you know, follow this level of detail and procedure to know. Uh, when Nancy Pelosi announced the day before the vote on the impeachment resolution that she had named House managers, they just reported that she had named House managers. What she had said is, this is who I intend to, you know, nominate as House managers. And later, when we pass the resolution, uh, actually, in this case, I think the rule and then a separate resolution that got incorporated into the rule that would name the managers. But we have to have that vote first until the vote is secure. We haven't named any managers per se, but, you know, try get that past a reporter. You know, we're still fighting over whether uh, 1400 plus 600 equals 2000 and whether that's sufficient to solve the case. So you see, that's not likely to get explained anytime soon. Anyway, uh, the real point here is that there's a lot of steps missing that haven't be, haven't happened uh, since uh, the passage of the uh, impeachment articles and that haven't been noted in here and that are just eliminated from the analysis, if you can call it that, that Burgess Everett and Andrew Desiderio put forward here. So anyway, I don't know. I mean, basically, we have fun parsing this stuff, but the upshot is they haven't done a good enough job on this article for you to pay attention to it uh, at a level that gets you upset. Trump impeachment trial crashes Biden's first hundred days. It doesn't. And we could spend hours discussing why it doesn't, but we already have. We may end up spending more. But suffice, I think, at this point to say that it doesn't. Here's a comment that I should bring up. Let's see, Mad Hatter uh, commenting in the middle. Yeah, I remember networks announcing that several secretaries were confirmed while that luncheon was happening. Uh, good. Good for you. Good memory. Uh, you can look it up if you want to. Uh, there are records over at congress.gov. If you know how to navigate the thing, you can look at roll call votes from in the Senate from previous 
Senates in previous years uh, uh, during the tenure of uh, different presidents, you know, find the corresponding uh, year where in those votes would be taken, 2017 in the case of Trump, 2013 and 2009 in the case of Obama. Look at the uh, correct uh, years in Congress. Look at those roll call votes for January and you'll see when those uh, votes went through. You want to do it? We can go through it. But yeah, uh, it's not a big deal. Now, uh, let's find some other mistakes here. Uh, we left off with the article after saying, provided the articles arrive by January 19th, the trial will start on January 20th. Nope. If the articles arrive by the 19th, what should happen is, well, if the articles arrive by the 19th, that means that there's been a message sent to the House, bring the articles over. Uh, assuming that's something that could actually happen without an actual working uh, uh, session of the Senate, uh, which also would assume that the House has sent its message to the Senate, it's been received, processed, answered, uh, and the invitation has been given. So let's assume that on January 19th, House managers show up with the articles. Uh, then the Senate invites them to present them, and then at that point, uh, they actually have the option. Under the rule, it looks like the default rule is that they say, okay, tomorrow at one o'clock, we will start the trial. <clears throat> but they have many options uh, to adopt their own orders of proceeding at that point. And no, it wouldn't require unanimous consent necessarily to do it, but I think that's the usual practice. But because it's the usual practice and impeachments are usually kind of contentious, <clears throat> they really have to hammer something out. And so it would be very difficult to see them coming to any conclusion under unanimous consent that a major portion of senators think is a major imposition either on the Biden agenda or on their own agendas. So the most likely option would be that however they decide to handle the trial, whether on the Senate floor or in committee, they wouldn't likely do it at 1 p.m. the next day. But in order for it to uh, trigger the default rule that it does start at 1 p.m., the next day, and that would fall at 1 p.m. on January 20th, there's a lot of messaging that hasn't happened that has to happen behind the scenes, and I don't even know if it can happen by January 19th. Anyway, they continue on. Only the same consent, that is to say unanimous consent, from the entire Senate will allow the chamber to create two tracks, one to confirm Biden's cabinet and pass his legislative agenda, and another for Trump's impeachment trial. Eh... Uh, if they decide to operate under unanimous consent, yes, but I think they can actually do this by motion as well or by rules change, which would be a little bit more difficult. Uh, let's see. I'm all for accountability, but I want to make sure that we prioritize our business in a way that gets the cabinet set and COVID relief legislation moving fast. Senator Chris Murphy said in an interview, then I think you'll find a lot of similar sentiment. That's uh, not that helpful. Uh, but they hold that out as, look, it's absolutely going to create a problem. Senator Chris Murphy will cry. But all he's really saying is, well, look, I prefer to do things this way. And they will and they can. So it's really not a big issue for him. But they make it like, oh, Murphy's ready to tear his hair out. Given that many Republicans impose, oppose impeachment or think it's not even constitutional once Trump has left office, that's wrong. It could be tough to get the co cooperation Biden needs to handle a trial alongside cabinet confirmations and begin work on a new coronavirus stimulus bill. Biden and Democrats say it's critical to cut a deal that does both, but one single senator can disrupt any effort to multitask. Eh, maybe. I don't know why this emphasis on unanimous consent. It comes from a reading of the rules, but it does not come from a reading of practice. Anyway, all that makes for an even higher degree of difficulty for Biden's cabinet and early legislative priorities to pass in the Senate, yada, yada. You know how that goes. Uh, working on Republic with Republicans to find a path forward, says Chuck Schumer, but whatever. And remember, he's set to take over as majority leader. Also, did you note from the rules that the Senate oath, if they did start the trial on the 20th and the Georgia senators hadn't arrived and been sworn in yet, you would swear the sitting senators in for the trial and then swear the new ones in first as senators and then give them the oath for the trial and they could just join then. 
There's no, you got to sit here for the whole thing or else you won't be able to vote provision or anything like that. Then they talk to Joe Manchin and guess what? He says some other things. Then they note, finally, they get around to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is unlikely to wait until after Biden's inauguration to trigger the trial's start by formally transmitting, oops, we're late on the music, formally transmitting the impeachment article over to the Senate. Is she unlikely to wait? Because she's been waiting, I think. Pelosi has been tight-lipped about precise timing, but her top lieutenant spent recent days emphasizing the urgency of moving the process to the Senate as quickly as possible. Well, now that they've found out that the trial probably can't start before the, at least the 20th, no matter what they do, I'm not so sure that they've been moving that quickly after all. All right, break now. Be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that K-Grow in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Okay, welcome back now to the K. Gordon Morning Show on the Networks Radio. The Networks Radio, like the Ohio State University, I guess. I don't know, I threw that one in there. The uh, weird spot in the music threw me off because I started late. Okay, uh, back on track here. I don't know what to do with this. I mean, I feel like the show is about parsing these things. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll do a lightning roundup for all these stories at the beginning of the uh, of, of uh, proceedings here this morning. And then I thought, oh, that'll be so uh, tough on Scott. And it's almost the weekend, et cetera. I don't know. And as I look through these things, I know I'll at the end be like, oh, crap, I didn't get to this, that, and the other thing that I absolutely intended to put in there. Um, but I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not that worried about it. We'll survive. And uh, I, the parsing of these rules is what the show is all about, quite honestly. Okay, let's see. Uh, so I've brought up the CRS document, the uh, impeachment process in the Senate. Uh, guess what? It's been recently updated, relatively recently, uh, January 21st, 2020, updated for the first uh, Trump impeachment trial. So anyway... Uh, it's, uh, relatively up to date. And first I'll give you from the executive summary, um, the basics in case we never get around to the real nitty gritty on some of this stuff, but, uh, they do lay this out impeachment rules, which we started with today, different from this description of procedure, the actual rules lay out specific steps that the Senate takes to organize for a trial. House managers, you know all about them, uh, read the articles of impeachment on the Senate floor. The presiding officer and senators take an oath to do impartial justice. And the Senate issues a summons to the accused and requests that a written answer be filed. Well, uh, that might take place ahead of time. It could take place ahead of time. This particular defendant isn't likely to be able to file anything ahead of time. And it's not entirely necessary that the written answer, I don't think it's necessary at all, the written answer arrive before trial starts, but they are given that opportunity. So they could, in fact, start things real early. The presiding officer, uh, oh yes, right, they issued the summons, accused can answer in writing. House managers are also then, of course, invited to respond during the trial, anyway, to the answer of the impeached officer. Now, Actions after these organizing steps, however, are not specified in the impeachment rules. Impeachment rules mention some actions that are common in judicial trials, opening and closing statements and stuff like that, but they provide little specific guidance. Instead, the rules allow the Senate, when sitting for a trial, to set particular procedures through the approval of orders. Now, some orders of the Senate are unanimous consent agreements, and the rules seem to hint that many more of them 
are than are in fact the case in than it is in fact the case in practice. And the Politico article says they're all done by unanimous consent. And it's just no, it isn't the case. Uh, but as they say, uh, some orders are by unanimous consent, but others are proposals adopted by the Senate. If such a proposal is considered while the Senate is sitting for trial, then debate is limited by the impeachment rules. As a result, in case you were wondering, the support of three-fifths of the Senate to invoke cloture is not necessary to reach a vote to approve procedural proposals. In previous trials, such proposals have been subject to amendment, and that can cause some delays, but not like the filibuster. Senate published precedents do not provide guidance on what can and cannot be included in such an order. So that's an open question. But in case you were wondering about, can Republicans filibuster the orders for uh, and the procedural rules for the trial? No, they can't. Uh, all right, that's settled. Compared to when the Senate meets in legislative and executive sessions, the opportunity for individual participation by senators in a Senate trial is limited. And in fact, this isn't actually all that important for what we're discussing here. Um, let's move forward in this paragraph here. Um, in modern trials, when senators proposed motions, it was often pursuant to a previously agreed to order of the Senate. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Then there's part about written questions. You might remember that from the first Trump trial. Orders of the Senate, however, might structure the time and process for posing questions during the open portion of an impeachment trial. Senators spend most of the time just listening to the arguments. Now, uh, here I mention in impeachment rule 11 that allows the Senate to create trial committees to hear and consider evidence, like I've been saying, and report it to the Senate so that you don't have to occupy much or any floor time at all. They can conduct the trial in a committee and approve uh, cabinet nominees and COVID relief on the floor while the committee is working elsewhere. Now, it does note such committees were not intended to be used for presidential impeachments, but four of the five impeachment trials completed since 1936 concerned federal judges. And in each of those cases, the Senate established a trial committee. Uh, it's been tested in court. It's gone to the Supreme Court. That was the Nixon v. United States, the case of Judge Walter Nixon, uh, that not only uh, confirmed that that was a fine way for them to proceed, but that it ought to be considered the precedent of the Supreme Court that they will not interfere in or second guess Senate procedural decisions that they make for themselves because of the constitutional prerogative of each house to set its own rules of procedure. They considered it a non-justiciable political question. Courts cannot interfere in the Senate's decisions on its own rulemaking. Now, they could overrule that. They could break that. They could write an exception at some point. But for now, the precedent says no. Now, there'll be an argument here where the Republicans will say, but look, it says right here in this non-binding executive summary of a CRS document, which isn't much help, that such committees were not intended to be used for presidential impeachments. And they'll probably have better authority than that, like the uh, Senate report on the, the uh, legislation that adopted these Senate impeachment rules or the resolution, Senate resolution that adopted them. Uh, and that might help, it might not. But then again, the other side will be arguing what? Uh, this is not a presidential impeachment. He's not the president anymore. Ah, but you impeached him when he was the president. So this will go back and forth. This is a little bit like our $1,400, $2,000 argument back and forth. You impeached him when he was the president. Ah, but who cares what that, ha that doesn't mean anything. That happened in the House of Representatives. We're the Senate. We're the ones holding the trial. Right now, he's not the president, but he was the president. And they may argue, I don't know that the documents we're working with here, remember how important papers are to these guys, right? Uh, the paper says that it is a document impeaching Donald John Trump, president of the United States. This must be a presidential impeachment. And that must mean it can't happen in the committee because the executive summary of the CRS report says that, but it's relying on some other authority. Uh, and uh, the Constitution, of course, says that the chief justice shall preside when the president is impeached. 
Uh, the answer to that will be yes. When the president is impeached, not a president or a person who used to be president, um, you could put the question to the chief justice and he'll say, I'm busy. I got to wash my hair that day. What if he decides not to show? No, my, my interpretation is I can't, I don't want to be there. I don't have to be there. I can't be there. One of the three. Now, of course, he might say, my interpretation is I have to be there. I guess that's possible too. Uh, but guess what can happen is they can settle the question. Uh, Madam President, will be Kamala Harris at this point. Uh, what do you think? What should we do? And she will say, all right, I don't know whether I will. I can have two options. I can rule from the chair or I can lay out my opinion or we can open it up to a vote of the house, of the uh, the chamber, the full body, the Senate. And guess what happens then? If you've got 50 Democratic senators who are interested in moving forward their way, then you've got 50 votes for no, it doesn't have to be on the floor. It can be in committee or no, it's going to be on the floor, but the chief justice doesn't preside, whatever. Uh, and uh, if it's a tie and Kamala Harris breaks it in their favor, boom, done. Not only does it happen, but it becomes what from our earlier discussion about Belknap, Pre uh, it becomes precedent. So easy to do, uh, provided you hold your votes together. And I guess nothing should be considered easy to do when you have to hold all 50 Democratic senators together. And of course, if the decision is being made after Harris has been inaugurated and can preside, but the two Georgia senators either haven't had their certifications um, issued or arrived or processed or haven't been sworn in or whatever, uh, that could create some difficulty as well. I wonder, I'm trying to think, can they cause problems if on the 20th, uh, Harris is in the chair, there would be 48, still about, you know, 48 Democratic voting senators present and 50 Republicans. And could Republicans say, uh, we're, I don't know, whatever, challenging the credentials of the, or we just aren't going to move to the swearing in just yet or delay it for an hour. I mean, can they monkey with the schedule? Normal practice, of course, is no, you move immediately to that. And it's one of the highest priorities when a senator, a newly elected senator arrives and is getting ready to present credentials and be sworn in. Uh, but what if they just fought over it and they had 50 Republican votes and the vote came out 50 to 48 and there was nothing Harris could do. There's no tie to break here. I wonder how long they could make that go on. Uh, no one knows because it's never been done. But I guess under my own old theory of delaying things, like, for instance, the theory by which uh, the uh, by Joe Biden then still presiding as vice president in 2000, early 2017, could have declined to take up the swearing in of new senators and thereby held the Senate at a at a um, at 66 or I don't know, 66 or 67 at that point, the size of the class members sworn and uh, hold the other 33 in abeyance and have a vote on the still pending nomination of Merrick Garland and installing him on the Supreme Court. If that's valid, it's possible that uh, Republicans could just sit on these two certain I don't believe they have any designs on doing it and it might get them I don't know at this point uh, beat up and <laughs> arrested and thrown out uh whatever but uh, you know maybe Ted Cruz wants to have an insurrection over that and try and delay the swearing in of the two Georgia senators I don't know they have no plans to do it I doubt very much it will come to pass the situation would be cured very shortly but I put it out there because hey we're in crazy times here all right so at any rate, we'll skip the rest of the executive summary on this point, but then move to the nitty gritty, I guess, down here um, on, well, let's skip ahead to page five here, where they begin the discussion of impeachment trial procedures and practice. Uh, let's see, this is the brief overview, and then there's the details. Does the brief overview help us? as an introduction here. Mm. Mm, not this, but 
The impeachment rules, they begin uh, in this paragraph, prescribe a series of steps for the start of the trial, which are described below. The Senate follows these steps to organize itself for the trial and then requests written statements from the impeached officer and from the House regarding the charges. The next stage is the receipt and presentation of evidence, and the impeachment rules provide little guidance regarding this process. So that part of the trial uh, can take some time. And by the way, I guess what you should take away even from this interpretation is even if we assume and then grant that the Politico article is 100% right, starting the trial doesn't necessarily mean all the senators then have to be in their seats and listen to the evidence from that point forward and nothing else can happen. Not only can we talk about shunting the whole thing aside to a committee or bifurcating the day or handling business in various different ways, but starting the trial might very well mean, all right, well, the trial has started and now we've moved to this point. As I'm reading this summary here, as we've moved to starting it, the next stage would be we could ask for written uh, statements from the impeached officer and from the House managers regarding the charges and then say, when that happens, we'll restart the trial. And in the meantime, let's start uh, confirming some cabinet secretaries and working on COVID relief. That can happen too. So the Senate could, of course, uh, decide how it wants to go on. They are expected to attend the trial unless, of course, it's happening in committee, in which case they're not. Uh, so Again, that uh, argues in favor of moving things into committee. Uh, now, receipt and presentation of the articles of impeachment. The details here. Impeachment rules establish a timeline for the Senate to take several actions after it receives what? The articles? No. Formal notice from the House regarding an impeachment. Specifically, under impeachment rule one, Senate action is triggered by the receipt of notice from the House that managers are appointed and are directed to carry those articles to the Senate. The House, in modern practice, first agrees to articles of impeachment. Uh, they've done it. They agree to another resolution that names managers and serves to instigate action in the Senate as prescribed by the rule. That is to say, authorizes the sending of the message. They don't always do it in a second resolution. Sometimes they do it in one resolution. Sometimes, like as this one, they had a separate resolution, but they incorporated it into the other one. Suffice to say... The House has done those things, but now we're not sure about the message. The message has been authorized. Has it been sent? Has it been received? We don't know. The House selects representatives, of course, to serve as impeachment managers. Those are the people who argue the case. The resolution also gives authority to those managers to take actions to prepare for the trial, hire people, gather their evidence, etc. The Senate now... Uh, in by unanimous consent, usually, right? Uh, well, I guess let me read you this introductory sentence here. In practice, as opposed to what the rules say strictly, after receipt of the message from the House, the following actions take place in the Senate. Now, usually the Senate then, by unanimous consent, establishes a time for the House managers to present the articles of impeachment to the Senate. Impeachment Rule 1 provides that the Secretary of the Senate blah, 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 immediately inform the House that will receive the managers. Now, instead of following the letter of the rule, however, the Senate usually reaches a unanimous consent agreement that sets a specific time for the Secretary to invite the House managers to appear. This time, agreed upon in modern trials, has been within a day or two of the receipt of the House message. Scheduling a time is more convenient for all the Senators uh, and these unanimous consent agreements have been reached within the context of a rule that appears to require immediate action. So usually they don't try to delay too much, but they get the chance to set the time. It's not an automatic thing. That's the modern practice, which means there's precedent for departure from the rules via different interpretations. Remember, these rules say this, that, and the other thing. They might say it has to be at one o'clock. They might want to adhere to that rule. But I remind you that the rules also say, not the impeachment rules, but the standing rules of the Senate still say that three-fifths of those senators duly chosen and sworn, in other words, 60 senators when there's a full 100, that there still need to be 60 votes to invoke cloture on an executive nomination or a judicial appointment. But is that something that you would say is true? 
in reality, in practice, does it take 60 votes now for cloture for a judicial nomination? No, it doesn't. Why? Because the precedents say it doesn't, that they've accepted that the, the Senate has voted to ratify the precedent, that in practice, it really only takes a majority vote to invoke cloture on these nominations. But if you look at the rules, the rules say 60. Well, it doesn't say 60. It says three-fifths. So if you just read the rules and then try to tell me how things work in the Senate, you would be wrong about that. What do you need to read? You need to read the precedents and how they are uh, used to interpret the rules. And I just don't think Politico did that. But if you don't want to read the precedents because they're boring or you don't know where to find them, you could just read CRS and they'll tell you what's really up here. That in practice, they just do things differently because there are precedents that say they can what else do they say here? A House manager, then, of course, once the invitation is issued, they come over. They read the articles of impeachment aloud on the Senate floor. That won't take long for these impeachment articles. Sometimes after a live quorum call to bring senators into the chamber. The impeachment rules require that the articles of impeachment be, quote, exhibited, which means read before the Senate, at a time arranged by unanimous consent and sometimes after a live quorum call to ascertain the presence of senators. We've explained those in the past. We won't stop on that now. House managers then arrive on the floor of the Senate, are announced by the secretary to the majority or the sergeant at arms, and are escorted by the sergeant at arms to seats assigned to them on the Senate rostrum. The presiding officer then swears everybody in. A House manager then reads the articles before the full Senate. The House manager also makes the statement uh, that the House reserves the right to amend the articles of impeachment. So let's say there's another insurrection this weekend. Uh, the presiding officer then announces again that everybody has to be quiet and listen up. And then the house managers uh, read. But then when they're done reading, what happens? The Senate, they say, will now take proper order on the subject of impeachment. That is, they will decide how to proceed and they'll notify the house when they've decided. And then at that point, the house managers then exit the Senate chamber. Does that sound like a trial is going to start right away at 1 p.m. on January 20th? It really doesn't. And that's even up straight up reading of the rules. They just skipped all these steps. Impeachment rule three, then, we read here in CRS, provides that after the articles are presented by the House managers, the Senate will proceed to consider the articles at 1 o'clock the next day, unless the next day is a Sunday, or sooner if ordered by the Senate, in modern trials, the Senate has most often taken the steps necessary to organize for an impeachment trial on the same day that the articles of impeachment were read on the floor. So they're usually ready for these things, uh, but that takes time. Are they ready now? No, they're probably not, which probably argues against their proceeding immediately to inviting the House managers over. They'll probably invite the House managers over when they're ready to set the order of trial very quickly and not before. After the presentation of the articles, the Senate takes the following steps to prepare to organize for a trial. Uh, there's the oath, of course. Uh, in the case of a presidential impeachment, Chief Justice acts as presiding officer. Uh, we're not sure what they're going to, whether they'll fight about that or not. That could take a long time. That's another thing that they might need to fight about and settle before they feel comfortable inviting the House managers over. Right? Okay. Uh, let's see. There's the uh, oath. We don't really need to deal with that. But if they once they get past the oath, the Senate issues the summons and requests an answer from the impeached official and a replication or response from the House managers. It is a necessary early step of an impeachment trial that the impeached officer be informed of the charges. He's probably aware through an official process, though. Impeachment Rule 8 states that after the articles have been presented and the Senate is organized for a trial. So that's a lot. I mean, not only have they been presented, but they have affirmatively made decisions how they will proceed with the trial and by what process they'll do it. At that point, a writ of summons shall issue to the person impeached. They could be just standing around in the wings waiting for it if they're really anxious to get started. But Trump will be in Pervilago and he'll probably never show up for the trial anyway. The Senate accomplishes this by, of course, agreeing to an order, sometimes in the form of a resolution. That would be not by unanimous consent. Directing that a summons be issued. Impeachment Rule 25 provides the language of the summons. You don't really need to hear about that. Uh, 
Now, when the Senate adopts an order for a summons, it also directs the accused official to file a written answer. The Senate determines the date by which this answer must be filed. Probably not going to be five minutes after they start the trial, though, right? Under longstanding practice, the real way things happen, usually, right? Under longstanding practice, uh, the Senate also sets a date by which the House managers can file their formal written response. That they might try to stick it, the Republicans might try to stick it to House managers, do it in five minutes, but it has to be an answer. So when do we expect Trump to answer? Maybe they've already got their answer. Who knows? Anyway, the length of time that the Senate provides for the impeached officer to file an answer and for the House managers to file their answer has varied in modern practice from a few days to several weeks. That doesn't sound like 1 p.m. on the 20th either. An order or resolution regarding the summons and replication is not subject to debate so no filibuster. They just go straight to the proposition and a vote on it. On the day that the Senate majority has established for the return of the summons, impeachment rule nine provides that the Senate convene the trial at 1230 p.m., which is also not one o'clock. Interesting. The officer who served the summons, usually the sergeant at arms, swears an oath administered by the secretary of the Senate that the service was performed. That's kind of uh, not that interesting and important, but there you go. All right. There's more. There are other administrative and organizational decisions to be made, of course. Um, but uh, if the point hasn't gotten across yet, there are about 50 steps that the Politico article simply breezes past uh, in order to then go on to the claim that the Senate is sp is split over the question of whether or not Chief Justice Roberts would preside. It, it, it's not, and it won't be, and it'll be settled in favor of whatever the Democrats want to do anyway. So that's kind of, they, they seem to have missed that point uh, for some reason. And then focus in again on Tom Cotton and his claim that the whole thing is invalid anyway. So I don't know what to tell you why they did that. I see no corrections being offered at this point. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's just sort of hanging out there. You should be aware that it's just not the way it's likely to really go. Uh, and that even if they decided to start the trial at 1 p.m. the next day, that doesn't mean that they immediately go full bore on this thing. It just means that a certain uh, a batch of decisions have to be made over how quickly they'll proceed and when they'll start. And the first decision that they could make is, yeah, we'll come back next week and figure this out. So there you go. They can do anything they want. That would have been a shorter way of explaining it, but not nearly as much fun as giving you some sense of <clears throat> how these rules are supposed to operate. All right. I don't know. Uh, it's Friday. It was difficult to decide how to proceed with a day like today, but uh, I wanted to at least point you to these resources. You can read for yourself uh, if you want over the weekend. Uh, this will dominate the news cycle for a little while, at least until they decide whether to have the trial on the House of uh, Senate floor or move it into committee. I think at the point, if they decide to move it into committee, I, I wonder, it'd be awfully difficult to believe that the second impeachment of Donald Trump uh, loses interest or people lose interest in it or, or the coverage uh, is lacking. But uh, a committee proceeding is not usually going to garner that much interest. Anyway, I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting uh, to contemplate as a political uh, analysis question. Mm, anything else that we really need to shoehorn in here? No, I don't think so. I think we've <clears throat> overdone it as it is on procedure. I regret the whole thing and wish I could take it back. I'll remind you, over the weekend would be a good time to take a look at those New York Times visual investigations. Uh, very good layout. Uh, of data visualization <clears throat> on uh, uh, the uh, what happened on the 6th and how it all went down. Oh, uh, this I didn't get to, but I guess you might take some pleasure in reading it over the weekend. I'll tell you what, you can go and read the article over at Daily Coast um, that uh, helps sum up a lot of the reporting on it. There are so many reasons to expel who? A new name here for you. 
but uh, we've heard his name on the program before. Madison Cawthorn this time, the target of this. So many reasons to expel Madison Cawthorn from Congress, and he keeps adding to the list. Walter Eininkel putting this together on Tuesday. I've seen reporting outside and other sources adding to this. Uh, I think probably the focus of it might end up coming to rest on the fact that uh, he, like Lauren Boebert, uh, he wasn't as much of a showboat about it, but guess what? He now claims that he has been going about in the Capitol armed all this time as well, and claims to have been ignorant of the rules against carrying weapons where everyone, but, uh, you know, I guess in the context of the insurrection, he wanted everybody to know, I was armed at the time, and, uh, yeah, we're going to have to deal with this guy, and not clear that he's going to be able to make it uh, through this entire session of Congress either, so check in on that, I would be more than happy to see him gone, but again, that too takes a two-thirds vote, I don't think anybody's going to be expelled at this point. Time to turn things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And guess what? I think he'll cast a broader net than I did today. And that's good news for our listening public. Let's see. Um, Hey, how about this headline? Democratic members of Congress are worried their GOP colleagues will kill them. But that's been a topic of some interest here on the show and in my Twitter account for some time. What else has he got on tap? Plenty more. Hang on. From NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to K-Grow. They'll be taking note, of course, of the black activists who are pushing back against the stupid uh, equation of the seditious capital siege, somehow, with Black Lives Matter protests for racial justice. Pretty stupid. Of course, I know you agree as well. And several Arizona lawmakers figure prominently in the D.C. insurgency. We'll hear more about that next.